So today we're going to talk, we're, I, I'm not going to introduce m much Haskell, or, uh, probably zero Haskell today, uh, and Brendan will start on that a bit tomorrow. But I'm going to talk about kind of foundations for the subject and get all the way to def the definition of categories today. Um, but first I want to say kind of what programming feels like to me. It's kind of like you're, it's kind of like a program is like a detailed plan of what you're going to do. It's so detailed that the computer can follow it, right? So it's like, I don't know where I'm going to start exactly, what time of day it's going to be, or where I'm, exactly I'm going to be, but I know I'm going to start somewhere in this place. And then depending on where I go, where I start, I'll go to some place over there. If I start in either of these two places, I'll go there. In this case, I'll go to this one. And in the last three, I'll go just directly to their counterparts over there or something like that. And so you say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. And then, then once I get to this place, I don't know where I'm going to end up because I don't know exactly where I started. Um, but, but whatever the case may be, I'll do the following thing. And you kind of say what you're going to do no matter what. So you could do it by kind of case analysis. In this case, I'll do this. And in that case, I'll do that. Or you could say, like, here's a pattern I'm going to follow. I'm going to, like, read something, and then I'll do what it says or whatever. And so you make some cons hopefully concise way of saying, like, what you're going to do in all the various cases. And maybe you kind of split off. Like, I'm going to give some information to Bob, and I'm going to give some information to Alice. They're both going to compute some stuff on their own, and then I'll recompile it at the end and, or, you know, put it back together at the end and do something from there. So that whole story of kind of this plan of action is what a program feels like to me. And it's also uh, kind of the story that we'll talk about today of categories. In a category, you can do that sort of thing also, um, but just not by looking at dots or something, but in a very abstract way. So, but before we get to categories, the, word, the words in the definition of category uh, involve words from sets, from set theory. And so we'll have to start with sets. Um, so there's a whole theory called set theory that is mainly interested in like cardinalities and, and um, sizes of sets and how different sets, uh, axioms for sets and things like that. And in that theory, they never really tell you what a set is, but they tell you if you had some, they tell you here's one I, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a zero empty set and I'm going to give you an infinite set. And then I'm going to give you lots of ways of making new sets. But I don't really tell you what a set is. All I tell you is that there's something called that, and that one set can be an element of another set. And it's like, you have like, this set is an element of this set, and so on. And it's kind of like a, a lot of like symbols, and, and it's kind of a little bit strange for me. And so this is like this theory of zermelo frankel set theory. And in, in today's course and throughout the rest of this course, we're not going to be using zermelo frankel set theory. So if you know that, then great, but th this will be much simpler in some sense. What a set is for us is one of these things. It's a bag of dots. So that's a set. It doesn't, doesn't have lots of braces in it. Now, this set, w one thing about it is that you can point to any of the elements of it. So someone can point to one. And another fact about it is if two people are pointing to, to elements, we can tell if they're looking at the same element or not. Those are basically all you need for our notion of sets. Yeah. That's right. That's right. A, a sack of dots. It's a sack. It's a sack okay. of dots. Okay. So this, this element is called A, and this one's called foo, and this one's called smiley face, and this one's called four. And that's a, ba a sack of dots. There we go. Um, that's a set. And what we could say is, like, if this set is called X, then we could say that A is in X, meaning that someone can point to that thing, and the pointer is called, it's really more like the pointer is called A than the dot is called A, from my point of view. But we could also say 4 is in X, but we would say 5 is not in X. And so this, if, if it, this symbol, it means, uh, is pronounced, is an element of. So this set has four elements, and A is an element of this set. Okay. So some of the nicest, or a lot of the sets I like, I denote N underline. Uh, so let me, instead of writing that, I'll just write 0 underline, 1 underline, 2 underline, 3 underline. So 3 underline is 1, 2, 3. It's got three elements, and the elements are called 1, 2, 3. 
Uh, two un an underline has two elements. One underline has one element. And this one has no elements. And so, so those are some sets. Those are nice little sets. And they're all, s each one is a sack of dots. Yeah. Does one contain zero? Do you contain zero? None of these contain zero. There is a set that contains zero. I, I, I started this way. Someone else might say, well, I like Python, or I like, I don't know, certain languages where I want this one to start with zero, and I want this one to start with zero, one, and stuff like that. Does that mean one contains itself? No, these are one underline, and that's one, yeah. that's one, the, um, the element, the, the, the little symbol. Okay. Wait, what are the underscores in there? Then? The underscores are the names of the sets. They're like the X. And uh, the things in the braces. Oh, I could have maybe it would have helped us say this is the set A foo smiley face uh, four. Yeah, thanks. So another set I like is uh, the natural numbers, and this is the set zero, one, two, three. Maybe it's annoying that these don't start with zero and this one does. I don't know. For some reason, I like that these. Uh, and the same more than I, but it's a personal choice. Um, so this set contains like 42 million or whatever, 42,000, and all other natural numbers. All they contain zero, and if something's in there, then that thing plus one is also in there. So a trillion to the trillionth power is in this set. Um, another set we might use sometimes. These are like the main. I bet these are probably the main sets we'll come up. We'll see or derivations of them. But another one we might see is called the integer. This one's called the natural numbers. And this one's called the integers. And I don't, does anyone know what the Z stands for? Uh, I didn't even hear, but I said, uh, anyway. Um, OK, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. What's the word? Zahle. 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 OK, German. Thanks. Um, OK, so this one contains the positive and negative numbers and 0. And that might come up. And other ones might come up, like the reals and stuff like that. But I don't think they will. If they do, it's not. You can always ask what a symbol means. Um, it wouldn't bother me if, yeah, if someone, if I wrote this and you asked, what is that? Like, please do if you've forgotten. OK, so these are some sets. Right, this one certainly it doesn't look ordered, right? Or does it? Oh, it looked ordered because, oh, I see, okay, yeah. <laughs> is that better? Yeah, so there is such a thing as something called an ordered set. And an ordered set is a set with a binary relation and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not sure if we're going to get to ordered sets today. I wasn't planning to. Um, but, but, Order is a category theoretic construct. It matters, but, it's, but sets don't have them. All that matters is that you can point at, at elements and tell whether you're pointing at the same one or not. OK, so sets are really like structure. They're like the minimal. I think they're, from my point of view, maybe they were chosen as a foundation for math because they're so, so simple in some sense. There's no real structure to them except you have some dots. <laughs> But there's a huge amount of structure in the relationships between sets. In fact, there's enough r structure in the relationships between sets that you can do all of math from that. And it's that that I'll talk about next with functions. But I think there might have been a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you define the equality of two sets? Uh, I'm not going, so I guess if we had to, we'll say that two sets are equal if they have the same exact elements. But we're not going to really need that. A more important notion is isomorphism between sets. Right. And that we will define. Yes? It may be that the microphone does not pick up the question. Oh, the question was, how do you define the, uh, thanks, how do, you find, how do you define equality between two sets? And in Sir Mello Frankel set theory, they say two sets are equal if they have exactly the same elements. And that's what we'll do too. But again, it won't come up too much. So functions are the relationships that are probably, um, in math, as it's been practiced over the centuries, been the most important relationships between sets. There's also something called a relation. I talked about a binary relation before. And those, in some sense, are more, even more primitive 
than functions. But you could start with functions and define relations, or you could define with, start with relations and define functions, and either way, you could get the one from the other. <laughs> and so since we're in a kind of Haskell class or a programming class, functions are more important for us. So we'll start with these guys. And what they are are uh, rules uh, for assigning um, values of one set to values of another. Uh-oh. To values of another. It's not a very great way of saying it, but... So there's a set. We could call it x. And there's a set. We could call it y. And a function is a rule for assigning values of y to values of x. So it's a rule, meaning it's what I said over here. What am I going to do in this case? Oh, in this case, I'll go to that element. And in this case, uh, I'll also go to that element. But in this case, I'll go to this element. And in this case, I'll go to the second element again. So that's a function. You could write, if this function was called f, then I would say, and this was 1, 2, 3, and 4, and this was a, b, and c, I would say f of 1 is b, and b is also f of 2, and b is also f of 4. So this is a legal thing to write. If you write equalities in a string, this class, I'm just saying they're all equal to each other. So f of 4 is, two, is b, but f of 3 is a. I mean, it might be nicer to write this in a table form, so we have x and y, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have a, a, b, whoops, b, b, a, b. So it kind of looks like a database. Okay, but the rule is that every element of x, in database theory, there's something called a key, a primary key, say. Every element of x gets only one element of y. If you don't know what a database is, that's totally fine, too. Each of these gets exactly one element to it. They might overlap. You might, might have like B several times. You might miss C altogether. So we know that Y is just A, B, and C. Um, those are its elements or whatever. But anyway, whether you like this way of looking at it or not, a function is a rule of that sort. So any questions on functions? I'll let you practice with them in a second, but any like kind of conceptual Yes, but the, that's right. So he asked, is the square root a function? And people often would say that the square root of 4, some, it, some people would say it's 2, and then some uh, other people would say it's plus or minus 2. And if you say it's 2, that's a perfectly good function. It's a function from a symbol I haven't yet defined, the non-negative reals to the non-negative reals. There is one called square root. But it's maybe if you're from, if you're a kind of, if you've done a little bit more math, you say, well, this isn't really the good one. The, the, the better one from my point of view, from my higher level point of view or whatever, is this two-valued function that actually goes to maybe r greater than or equal to zero times r t less than or equal to zero. And I haven't defined these symbols, so now I'm like really stuck here. But four here <laughs> will go to like two comma negative two. Maybe that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a two-valued function. Oh, but that fails two because zero went to zero comma zero. No, that's OK. It's both greater than and less than 0. So everything's great. Uh, square root, you could define to be this sort of thing. And then it's fine. This we're going to define as a set pretty soon. And this is a, is a set, if, 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 if you know what it means. And we could define square root, of, square root to be this sort of function. But you're right, it's always one valued. So even if it, if it seems too valued, we have to fix that up somehow, like this weird trick I invented on the fly that I've never heard of or can't really stand behind. Um, okay, other questions? Yeah. Given the words, do you like to think of a function as total function or area? Yeah. Those words blending to be ambiguous whether it's partial or not? Yeah, so this rule is, is like a, t it, you might add a total and deterministic. By deterministic, it means that there's no choice. Uh, you can't choose whether you want the positive or negative square root or whatever. And by total, it means everybody gets one. E everybody in the domain or the, the x thing there gets, gets an a value. Um, now, in the book, we're going to give a precise formal definition. And if someone raises their hand at any point and says, I want a formal definition, I'll do it. 
Like, that's the kind of question you can ask for, and I'll, I, that one I would actually just go ahead and do. Uh, but I'm not going to do it unless you ask, because it's a matter of understanding and the fact, like, does, does it make sense to you? Maybe you already know and you don't need it, or there will be no chapter class where it'll be formally defined. But if you feel like you need it to follow, then go ahead and ask, for sure. So if there's any undefined values, like log of zero, that's not a function. That's not a function. That would be a function from some limited domain. So let's say you had log. I would say, oh, that's a function from r greater than zero. This little subscript, I also haven't told you formally what it means, but that's how I denote like a subset. So it's from all r positive real numbers to uh, real numbers. So I always force it to be total by changing this if I need to. OK, other questions? So here's a question for you then. So turn to a neighbor and figure out how many functions are there Period. No, just kidding. How many functions <laughs> are there? Uh, from 2 to 3. And if you get that one, then from m to n. Okay, so turn to someone, or figure it out for yourself, but feel free to turn to a neighbor and figure out how many functions are there from the set I called 2 to the set I called 3. Do you know? Okay, um, start to wrap that up. Okay, so first of all, are any questions from thinking about it? Any questions from talking to your neighbor? Any questions anywhere? Or is this good? Everything's clear enough? Okay, so how many of these are there? Two total functions from this one to this one? How, I'm not sure. How many functions are there? So let me list some. There's this one, the one I already drew. There's this one. Whoa. <laughs> OK. OK, there's two already. So how many total are there? Yeah. Do you know? Nine. Yeah, there are nine. Basically, each one of these guys gets to choose where it goes. So there's three choices for this one, three choices for this one and they multiply. So there's nine. Nine. They're kind of like one, 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 two, one, three, two, one, two, 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 three, three, one, three, two, three, three. And the fact that this kind of arranges into a nice grid is not a coincidence. Um, but what is, what exactly is the coincidence and what isn't? Is it that, yeah, there's like a two, there's a three by three grid. Hmm. So what is the, what is the actual pattern here? How many functions are there from m to n? Yeah. N to the m. Yeah, n to the m. And so what that's saying is it's an m-dimensional cube of n things on each side. That's the pattern. And does this formula work when, um, when say, m is 0? Yeah, when, let's, say there's, let's say this thing's empty, so m is 0. Then it was ambiguous what I wrote here, this total indeterministic rule. I didn't say what it really was. But it's really that every dot here has to get a dot to, that it goes to. And since there are no dots in m equals 0, uh, the rule is vacuously satisfied. But there's not any choices on how to satisfy it. It's like, OK, I did what you said, but I, don't, I didn't do anything. OK, so is that one thing or no things? Well, it did what we said, so let's say that's one thing. But it, there is no choice involved, so it's just one thing. Yeah? What does 3-3 three, three mean when you're going from a set that doesn't contain 3 to a set that um, It means that this, this thing went to 3, and oh, this oh, thing went to 3. Thanks for asking. Um, OK, so it works even when m is 0. Does it work when n is 0? If this thing was 0, 
then is it true that you always get 0 to the power m functions? So if m is, is not 0, then there are no functions. There are no functions from this thing to 0, because they all need a place to go, and they don't know how to go. So it really works when this guy is not 0. And the only case left when m is not 0. The only case left is when m and n are both 0. And then it's a matter of kind of like convention, whether you, what you think m 0 to the 0 is. And in calculus, they'll tell you, there is no 0 to the 0. You need to tell me how you're limiting. You know, are you limiting faster on the 0 or on the 0? And, <laughs> and they're right in calculus. But in, in natural numbers, I think it's, for me, it's totally clear that I want this, I really want this to just be the number of functions, because it works in a trillion, quadrillion, it, it works in every case, except possibly this one, where you don't really know what, it, what you should mean. Just mean the thing that works, because then you never have to think about it again, and this always just counts the functions. So, so for us, the convention is that it works perfectly. Just like, how did people come up with like 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half? Because they wanted this convention to work, that like when you multiply a to the b times a to the c, you get a to the b plus c. And if they make this true, then they get this beautiful formula. And that makes, like, math is all about, like, things that are conceptually clear enough that you can just, like, get going. And so we're going to just make it the case that 0 to the 0 is 1. There is one function from 0 to 0. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's, that's the story of sets and functions. Oh, there's another... Another one I'll, I'll use sometimes, which is another set I'll use, which is true-false. True-false. It's called bool. Um, so what's the difference between bool and two? Yeah. Their types are different? They don't have the same elements. And yet, somehow, it's like whenever someone uses bool and someone else is using true, we know we could translate back and forth between them, right? I'll just make one be true and two be false for some reason. As long as I, it doesn't matter my reasons, all I know is I can translate back and forth. And that notion of translating back and forth is what an isomorphism, is the definition of isomorphism. So be, but before we go there, let me talk about composition of functions and identities, and then we'll be able to say what an isomorphism is. And this notion of isomorphism will work in any category. You don't know what a category is, but we're actually just building up the pieces that we need for categories as we're going here. And soon um, we'll know that the, there, the sets form a category, and isomorphisms like between bool and two will make sense in any category, that sort of thing. So, so the to get there, we need to talk about composition. And composition of functions is that someone gave us a way of getting from A to B, and someone else gave us a way of getting from B to C, and we just kind of put them together. So the composite of a function f from A to B and a function g from B to C I usually like to write it like this, f semicolon g, but it's more commonly written g circ f, circle f. And either one of those is fine. This is like a circle prime for writing it backwards. It's really nice in lots of cases because you just read in the order that you write f circle g. It's kind of not so nice in Haskell or in programming languages because you might want to write like f of a, well, for various reasons we'll get into. But anyway, so composition means, or G composed F, says like G composed F of some element X, what is it defined as? It's G of F of X. That's the definition. I'll often write a colon equals to mean like this is a definition. Um, this thing is a new function. What function is it? G composed F is the function from 4 to 5 that, well, what does it do to the top thing? It sends it to the third thing, because you just follow the, the, the arrows there. Is that good? OK, so the second thing goes to the fourth thing. The third thing goes to the third thing. Ah. 
I see. And the fourth thing goes to the top thing. So that's composition of functions. It's like sine of cosine. For some reason in calculus, you're always taking derivatives of things like sine of cosine. <laughs> like in case, just in case you need, well, anyway, so, uh, so uh, I shouldn't make fun of other subjects. <laughs> so you just are taking, you know, you're taking a big composition of functions. Uh, you're, you're just doing a lot of things in order. And that happens in programming because like y you, you want to make modular programs. You don't want to program for every possible thing that's like as long as, you know, as long as the number of cases. You want to reuse functions over and over, right? And because of that, you're just going to have like this, a few functions that you use in various different ways. And composition is one great way of combining functions. Another one is parallel. I mean, uh, there are other ways of combining functions. I'm getting stuck because it's not parallel like parallel processors. It's like you're doing two things. Alice and Bob are both each doing something, and we're going to combine them later. But OK, so this is composition of functions. And then there's a fact that composition is associative. And that means that if, someone, if there's actually like someone behind this one doing something, and we first combined these two functions into one, and then did this one, it would be the same thing as first doing this one, and then combining these two into one. right? If, but all it really means is you can follow paths unambiguously. The fact that we wrote g composed f as like a, a way of taking two things and making one, we could have also taken three things and made one. Um, so the formula that I'm saying is true, the, the associative law, is that if you do e and then f and then g, it's the same thing as doing e and then f and then g. And the fact that you couldn't even hear the difference between the two things I said, except for like minor pausing, is the fact that they're the same. That, that's one. Or g of f of e is g of f of e. Okay, that's called the associative law. Yeah? Yeah, so it's annoying from reading like this. So here's a nice way of uh, why it's, it's kind of nice, is like, let's say you, have, you wanted to know what f of a was. So usually you write f of a, and then it gets annoying, this, this notation here, because it's, like it's like all backwards. But what if I think of a as the pointer from one to that thing? Like, the, the elements of this set are exactly the pointers from one. Because if this is a, then a to the one is a. Like functions from one to a is a, so I can I can just denote this by a pointer, by a little uh, a function. So this is also a, pick out a and then do f, and then it just reads smoothly across the board. Like pick out a, then do f, then do g. So yes. So another way to think about it with your plan notation that would be like there'd be right operators and the conventional notations left operators. Sure. Yeah. Sounds right. I don't, I don't know the, like if, if left operator is a technical term, but what you said sounds like if it is, it's probably going to be true. Oh, uh huh. Yeah, yep, yep. Okay, so that's composition. And then another important thing that seems very like not important is identity functions. But identity functions are, are to functions like zero is to numbers. They might have thought it was not a number for a long time, or that it was evil if it was a number. <laughs> but in the end, it's like a really nice number, because uh, it just is. I don't know. It's just a nice number. If you didn't have zero, you couldn't have negatives. You wouldn't know what it meant that negative three and three are related. It's just that three plus negative three is zero, right? So the identity function on, on three, say, is a function from three to three. And the function is the one that assigns everything to kind of itself. And this function has a property that if you take any function f and you compose it with the identity, so let's say f goes from a to b again or something. If you compose f with the identity on b, it's f. And if you compose f with the identity on a, it's also f. So if you do this thing and then anything, it's as though you didn't do the identity thing. And this, these two laws here, these are laws or just facts about functions, 
are called the unital facts. The associative fact is that functions, asso uh, functions compose associatively. And the unital fact is that functions as as compose unitally. In other words, this is a unit, like it's like a one or a kind of like uh, doesn't do anything function. So these are these are these will eventually be called unital laws for a category. But right now, let's just, they're just kind of facts. I don't know. Any questions about that? Okay, so we're finally ready to say what an isomorphism is. A function f from a to b is called an isomorphism if there exists if someone so someone tells you they have an isomorphism what they have to do is they have to exhibit a function g from b back to a uh, such that If you do f and g, it's identity on A. And if you do g then f, it's identity on B. Actually, I should, I should probably use the other notation for two reasons. I really like this notation, but I think that we're going to be using this one more often. I think Bartosz prefers this notation, and it's probably more familiar. So I'll try to stick with that one. OK, so that's the definition of an isomorphism. And this is, this is the, when I said that 2 and Boole are isomorphic, actually what I said was that um, you can go back and forth, right? That's what I said. You can go back and forth, and they're, they're the same. What is this going back and forth? It's that, it's that I don't care if you send 1 to true or 1 to false, but then send the other one to true, and I know that you can kind of go back from that and, and, and come back where you started. So this says there's a function f that's an isomorphism from 2 to bool because there's some function g I could pick that undoes it. And not only does it undo it that g composed f is identity on 2, but also f then g is identity on bool. And so, like, for all intents and purposes, they're the same in the sense that someone has exhibited a way of, of making them the same. So any questions on that? Yeah. So is that just that like, if one function never maps to the same point on another sack? Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> That's a good question. So is it the case that if I have two sets and no two of these guys went to the same element of the other set, are, they isomorph are the two sets isomorphic? So someone shook their head, so why? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this one doesn't reverse. It almost reverses. You can get back where you started from. So it's like, yeah, no, it, it's fine. It's fine. I don't care. Uh, there. That reverses just fine. You get back where you started no matter what. But it doesn't reverse when you go starting at this one. So a property like, uh, if you have a function of that sort, it's called a retraction. And so the, the thing you said is um, almost a retraction. There's, if someone is, is totally bored and knows all this stuff, like, is it the case that every injection is, a, is part of a retraction, that there's always a way to go back? Yeah. So, trying to figure out the terminology-wise, a sack has unique elements for a bag to have repeat elements? Oh, right. So, that, the technical, the reason for sack is, first of all, I think it's a funny word, but second of all, um, because, uh, because bag has technical meaning in computer science, and it's one where you're allowed to repeat elements, so you could say that, like, you could, you could say 2 is in, the set, in, is in this bag twice. And I don't, I don't mean bag in that sense. And I don't know if we're ever going to talk about bags in that sense in this class. Okay. It's just that the objection that someone had in the beginning, Sorry. it's OK, <laughs> uh, was that. And it's totally reasonable in a class for, computers, for computer people that that would come up. OK, okay other questions? Yeah. Multi-set instead of bag? Yes, that's, that's fine, yeah. And, and again, I don't think we're going to need those anyway. OK, so now we know what an isomorphism in it is and why Boole and 2 seem so similar. They're isomorphic. And so I think it's 
where you can now define categories. Any questions before we do? Yeah. Yeah, a function's invertible if, um, if there's another function that when you compose them, you get the identity. Now, some people would say left invertible or right invertible. That would mean like I can get the identity if I do one of them but not the other. But if it's invertible in d both directions, then it's an isomorphism. Yeah. Yep. Other questions? Okay, so um, maybe this deserves its own board. Kind of, so the weird thing, one, one, one thing that's kind of, whoa, all right, it's, it's hand time, I guess. Oh, no, here we go. Uh, in, in category theory, one, one kind of different thing from other parts of math is how long the definitions often are. They're just like, <laughs> go on and on, and the person just writing and writing. Um, luckily, though, I've, I've said all the parts of this definition in this example that we worked out throughout the entire day here, which is that um, when we define a category, um, called C, you can think of C as the category of sets. You don't know what the category of sets is yet, but just watch as I say stuff. And I'm going to try to make sure you, uh, you know like which parts of this definition correspond to what things we just said in this talk so far. So a, a category consists of some stuff subject to some rules. Um, I sometimes call them constituents for a lot, lack of a better name. So what are the constituents? What do you need if someone says they have a category? What can you demand of them? You can ask them, one, uh, give me a set, and I want you to call it ob C, of, um, that elements are called objects. It's not a set. Some people say it's a set of objects, but then, then you don't know what an object is. It's not a special set. It's just a set. And the elements of that we're going to call the objects of C. Two, for every two objects, C and D, elements of this set. Oh, sorry. The objects in this category of sets are sets. And if you're worried about Russell's paradox, we can talk about that after class. <laughs> There's something called growth and Deke universes that make that problem go away. Um, so we're, what, what's, what's going to happen is we're going to take some big, big universe U, and we're just going to take elements from that and make them the objects of C. OK, so there, there is a set of objects in your category. For any two objects, there is a set called C, denoted C, C comma D. This weird E looking thing is a C. Some people think it looks like an E. Um, this is the name of our category. So C, C, D, C of C, D is the set of morphisms in C. These are called morphisms from C to D. OK, so so far, we've, in the thing we were talking about before, the objects would be sets. For any two sets, there is a set of morphisms from one set to the other, the set of all functions from one set to another. Okay. Three, uh, for each object, C, a chosen element ID sub C in morphisms from C to C. Hmm. Let me also say, I'll denote this. So if, so here's a little thing for, for notation. If F is in C, C, D, I'll write F colon C arrow D. Okay. And so here I have ID C from C to C. So for every set, there is a, a chosen element, a chosen morphism, 
a chosen function from C to itself that is the identity function. And four, for, uh, uh, for morphisms F, so for, for, any, for any three objects, C, D, E, and function, and morphism, sorry, morphisms, F from C to D, and G from D to E. Again, you could instead write F in C, C, D, and G in C, D, E. Um, there is a morphism, a chosen morphism, G circ F from C to E. And those are the constituents, four things. I mean, lots and lots of things, because there's lots, lots of these to, to keep track of, but this, this is what it is. And by chosen, what I mean is, if someone tells you they have a category, let's say I say, oh, vector spaces form a category, and you say, I don't know what you mean by that. What you're allowed to ask me is, sorry, what are the objects? And I say, oh, the objects are the vector spaces. Like, okay, that makes sense. And what are the morphisms from R2 to R3? Because those are both vector spaces, right? It's like, yes, those are the linear transformations. So if, if someone asks you, if, if someone tells you they have a category, you're supposed to tell them, you be able to, you're, you're supposed to ask, be able to ask them, what are the objects, what are the morphisms, what are the identities, and how do you compose? And then once they tell you those things, you can check them on a couple facts. You can check them on, um, on two rules. And those rules are, the, are unitality and associativity. Pretty basic rules, or at least it seemed like it in sets. Um, so one rule is that for any morphism F from C to D, for any C and D, F circ ID is F and F ID circ F is F. So which one is this? Is this identity on C or identity on D? Yeah, I think it's C. So if I do identity on C, and then I do F, it's the same thing as just doing F. And identity on D composed F is F. So that's called the unital law. It's not a law like gravity that's just like true for all time or something. It's more like a rule that someone has to satisfy to give if they want to say they have a category. And B, uh, for any three morphisms, this is the associative law. I don't know, you got C1, C2, C3, C4. You got F1, F2, F3. Then F3 composed with F2 composed with F1 is F3 composed with F2 composed with F1. And the fact that it's ambiguous, like the fact that saying it like that is so hard to hear is not a problem. It's just, uh, it's actually good. Like there is no difference between, we could just write this as F3 composed F2 composed F1 and not worry about how it's parenthesized. So any questions? That's a category, this long string of, of things I've just said. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so how about um, the category? So let's say we have the objects of my C sub bad are the natural numbers. Okay, that's a set of objects. And, um, wait, what am I about to do? Oh, I'm going to do a monoid, sorry. Um, yeah, so let's say the objects of C sub bad, there's just one object called, called smiley face. And, and C sub bad of C D is going to be the natural numbers. 
of smiley face, smiley face. Okay, so this has one object, and it's got lots and lots of arrows. It's got one called one, one called two, one called three, one called zero. And one thing I could do is I could say the way you com that the identity on smiley face is zero, and if I have the composite, if I take a map from smiley face to smiley face, called three or m and n, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take m plus n. This does not violate any of these rules. This would be a perfectly good category. I'm stealing a little bit of Brenda's thunder for tomorrow. And this is called a monoid. It's a category with one object. And I, this, all the things here work. So it says there's one object. There is, for every two objects, well, there's only one, um, there is a map, there's a set of all maps from C to D, all morphisms. And those are the natural numbers. And there's an identity morphism. Uh, that's number three. Where did it go? Three. And for any two morphisms, I can compose them. And I'd compose them by adding. And this satisfies all the rules. So this one's fine. But one that doesn't is m to the power n. That one would fail. And the reason is that m to the n to the p is not m to the n to the p. So it, sa it violates um, associativity. Another one that would fail is in, if instead of composing by n equal, by plus, like I did, which makes the unit of law work, if I composed by times, then this would be the wrong unit because identity composed four should be four, but it turned out to be zero, so I'm using times. So I could have the wrong unit, or I could have non-associativity. Does that, does that help? It's a weird example, because like, you probably weren't expecting this kind of category, and I kind of went directly to, the, to it, but um, you see that it's non-associative here? Yeah. What I, nope, nope, it, it, yeah, this is, so for, peop, for programmers who know some category theory, they tend to think, I don't know if this is your situation, but they tend to think of a very particular category, namely something like a type, type system or something like the category of sets. I should probably try to get to that, but I don't know if I will. Um, but here, all I required of you to give me a category was to say that for every two objects, there, there is a set elements of which I'm going to call morphisms. That, here is a set, and I'm going to call 17 a morphism. And 17 composed with 32 is 30, 49. <laughs> um, well, yeah, thank you. Thank, uh, <laughs> Say that again? You mean the fact that the object, there's only one object? Right, doesn't that mean there's only one morphism? No, what it means is that there's only one HOM set. There's only one C smiley face, smiley face. There's only one set of morphisms. They all point from that object to that object. And when I compose them like one, then two, I get three, say. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So here's a category. Um, it's got two objects, one and two. So ob, here's c, and ob c is one, two. And hom, and, and c from one to one is just the identity, and c from two to one, two to one is going to be empty, and c from one to two is going to be empty and C from 2 to 2. The morphisms from 2 to 2 will just be the identity. This is called the discrete category on two elements. So it's just kind of got this little identity there and little identity there. Yeah? So um, is it just standard to give the name of the set of morphisms the same name as the category? Yeah. Or is it, okay, so it's yeah. like a lot of times people not confuse the, the like C without the brackets and C with the brackets for the set of morphisms? So one thing you can, a lot of people do is they write, instead of C, they write HOM sub C from C to D. Okay. Because HOM is short for homomorphism, which is kind of where category theory got to start. If you know what a group homomorphism is, et cetera. 
they would write HOM. But if you don't, it doesn't matter. Um, HOM is just, people might call this the HOM set from C to D. Um, it's just a name. But the subscript C reminds you what category you're in. Okay, I guess that's time. So feel free, there's probably lots of questions. Feel free to come up afterwards and, and ask them. There's lots of people who can help answer them, not just me. I'll see you tomorrow. It was a really good study too. So if you had